working on a projects that are sort of intersecting the uh, background in aquatics with uh, some more terrestrial approaches now. Uh, so sort of straddling the meniscus here. And I'm hoping to learn, to learn, learn more about how these how this current project intersects with a number of things that we're currently working on, including the completion of the riparian mapping project, uh, the same lab, um, also the RAT tool, I'm going to touch on it as well, and some of the river styles work with the aquatics folks are also part of Any other things you want to highlight? Uh, no, that's sure. great. Thanks a lot, Russ, and thanks everybody for coming out today. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk with you all. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in here. I'm, I'm showing uh, some of my work and then some work from my colleague Wally McFarlane and then uh, Joe Weeks as well. And, um, and then a bunch of other people have been involved with these projects and I'll kind of mention that as I go. Um, up front I, I kind of wanted to apologize. I recognize some faces in here who have seen some Joe Wheaton Beaver talks before. So you're, there are a few slides that I've used of his, but I definitely have some new material here as well. So I'll try and get through some of the more general stuff um, as quickly as I can to spend more time talking about our sort of case study projects that we have going on with division. Um, like Russ said, I'm going to talk a little bit about Brad. I, uh, Wally has uh, given, and Joe have given a lot of presentations on Brat at this point too, so I'm going to kind of just talk about it from an applied perspective of, of what you can do with the products and show some maps that we've made with the products. And then I'm going to talk briefly about some other kind of newer network tools that, that we've been developing in our lab to be able to use for planning and restoration prioritization purposes. And then I'm going to be talking about uh, around half a dozen uh, different projects where we're working with the division on uh, fever related issues, mainly having to do with restoration, but also some living with beaver strategies, um, which I mentioned up here, which is basically just techniques to deal with beaver nuisance behavior. So really quickly, um, I'm a fluvial geomorphologist and researcher at the Fluvial Habitat Center at uh, Utah State. Um, studied fisheries biology and then got into geomorphology for my masters. And then really what we try and do in our lab, and you know, I imagine every lab tries to do this, but basically uh, we're trying to learn the most useful applied information and then disseminate that information as uh, as easily as possible to um, managers and restoration practitioners. So always uh, really happy to have opportunities like this to get some feedback from some of the some of the folks that we're working with on some of these projects. So feel free to, to ask questions and comments afterwards. Um, okay, so Again, I know many of you have actually taken some of these workshops. We have these two to three day workshops, and so some of the material that I'm presenting is kind of a condensed version of, of what we present in these full length workshops. Um, we don't actually have any on the books right now, but I, I know we'll be doing some um, moving forward this year, and we've actually done a couple of workshops already that I know some folks in this room have participated in that were still <coughs> fully completed. Um, and then we've got this uh, beaver restoration guidebook that's available now, published by uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that we um, helped with um, that is a good resource for learning more about beaver. So um, we're here to learn a bit about beaver, some restoration strategies <coughs> using beaver, and then um, some techniques to deal with their nuisance behavior. Um, and so to do this, I'm going to just kind of get through quickly some of this basic stuff about their biology and ecology, particularly focusing on their role of ecosystem engineers through their dam building. And then we'll talk more about where in the landscape of these strategies make sense. So um, the hope here is, is that beaver can help us restore many of our degraded streams and rivers for a lot less money than traditional methods. And will, through their dam building, promote much more dynamic behavior in streams and rivers that will lead to better water quality, healthier, healthier ecosystems, and higher biodiversity. So, we can't forget, though, that they can be pests. As many of you who have any direct hands on experience working with beavers you know that they basically build their dams wherever they please. Um, and so, they can cause flooding, block culverts, cut down the trees that we plant, and, and just generally make a mess. So, I'm going to talk more about the need to address this nuisance behavior and a way in which we've been doing that through these beaver management plans. Um, okay, so jumping right into a bit of beaver biology. Um, 
Beaver are highly social territorial. Critters usually living in colonies of between six to eight related individuals. They have typically between two to five uh, kits per year. The young will stay with the parents for at least the first couple of years before heading off and setting up their own lodges and complexes. They're considered habitat generalists and highly adaptable so they can make a living kind of wherever within the aquatic environment. They even will sometimes live in somewhat saline um, wetlands and uh, you know towards the mouths of rivers. But um, what they need to build dams is a little bit different. So they don't build dams everywhere. And, and again, you know, I'm going to be emphasizing their role in dam building um, because that's what we really care about, mostly from a restoration perspective. But they have this huge distribution because they are such generalists, generalists and so highly adaptable. So essentially they're just limited by wood or the necessary amount of water um, on north, wood, water, south. And this uh, map of their distribution is actually a little bit out of date. Um, there's been recent work to show that beaver were um, traditionally in coastal northern California and southern Oregon as well as in parts of central Utah and Nevada. So that's getting updated. Um, Again, by being generalists, they'll eat kind of whatever is available to them. And in northern climates, their diet shifts seasonally where they go to a more woody plant-based diet in the winter, and they're eating more herbaceous plants in the summer. <coughs> northern climates, they have to establish food caches, so they'll, in the fall, start to build up these caches that they can then access um, through an underwater entrance in their logs within their ponds, and so they can eat off of those food resources throughout the winter. Um, they're considered central place foragers where they forage from instead of a nest, a lodge, um, going out to get their preferred uh, forage items. Again, they'll eat kind of whatever's available, but they do have preferences and you know, there's different nutritional benefits with different food resources. They prefer ash and willow, cottonwood, alder, but typically don't want to get more than about 100 meters from the water. You can think of them like rotational crop farmers where they'll selectively work an area pretty hard and then move on after a few years and move back again. So what you end up with is these sort of mosaics of heterogeneous uh, habitat where basically you're not going to always have everything in a ponded condition because they'll stop working an area and then move back there again. And what we, have, what we believe and what the science really suggests is that that dynamic heterogeneity is really a hallmark of a healthy ecosystem and a healthy river. So um, through their browsing, it uh, can actually change the growth patterns of some of their preferred forage items. So you know, basically beaver have co-evolved over millions of years with most of the species that we care about, whether it's in stream or in the red parent area. And so what we've actually shown is that through beaver herbivory, the stem density of some plants, like in this case American beech, actually increases through their browsing. So, Getting into why do beaver build dams, um, again, it's the dam building that we care about that have all those important feedbacks. Um, obviously, they're not building dams for restoration purposes. They're building them for when they need to basically have safe areas that they can forage from um, to escape from predators and to store food. So those are the primary reasons why they build dams. Along those lines, um, you know, aquatic habitat is really critical for their success. So they're much more agile in the water than they are on land. They try and maximize their time in the water. And again, those ponds provide their foraging pathways to um, get to their food resources and they avoid predators. They usually have some kind of underwater entrance in their lodge and then an above water area for, um, for spending time in the lodge. So, <coughs> excuse me, getting into the uh, feedbacks that we care about in terms of dam building. Um, so they have a lot of different effects. Uh, and I'm just kind of jumping into some of them here that you know, I could have organized these differently. But essentially, one of the things, one of the main things that their dams do is trap sediment. So what this figure here is showing is your aggregation rate in meters per year on your y-axis and your age of a, of a particular dam. On the x-axis is from Pollock et al. 2007. All this is showing is simply just that you can have pretty substantial aggradation rates that then tail off over time at a particular dam based on the age and how quickly it takes to fill in that dam. Um, what happens by trapping that sediment, spreading it out onto the floodplain, you're creating more um, areas for riparian um, vegetation to become established on that floodplain. So it can actually expand the riparian area over time. 
Um, beaver dams can influence hydrology. This is not actually data. This, obviously, this is just a conceptual diagram showing kind of your typical snowmelt driven hydrograph in black. And so we just got an annual hydrograph on the x axis and then discharge on the y. And you know what we all know around here in the Intermountain West, we have a lot of snowmelt driven hydrographs that have these really distinct peaks sometimes in the late spring, early summer, and then that uh, typically tails off pretty rapidly, sometimes ending up with less water than we may want towards the late summer. Um, so what natural beaver, dam, beaver dams have done, other researchers have shown this, is that they can actually have these, they can affect the annual hydrograph in these pretty substantial ways where you can actually see a reduction in peak flows and then an increase in the magnitude of your late season flows and potentially an extended duration of your late season summer flows. And, Essentially, that all just relates to the fact that these dams are functioning like sponges that are kind of temporarily slowing the transit of water as it's moving down within the watershed. They're not fully blocking it and, and preventing that water from getting down to the downstream users. They're just slowing the release of it. So in a lot of ways, it's functioning like a snowpack. And what all this stuff kind of does, essentially, is blurs the boundaries between rivers, wetlands, and uplands. So we've got pretty distinct upland area here. We've got our riverscape down here. And what we're showing in this picture is just a couple of beaver dam analogs, which I'll talk about a little bit later, which are just artificial beaver dams that we built to try and initiate particular restoration objectives. And um, and it really what it's doing is it's it, this in-stream roughness is slowing down the flow and spreading that flow during high flow out onto floodplains. And by doing so, it essentially blurs these boundaries and expands the red parent zone. Okay, and so, so this is just kind of a list of some of the perceived positive impacts of beaver dam building. And it's basically just what I was just saying. It's slow snowmelt runoff, you can create good in-stream um, and riparian habitat, increase groundwater recharge, elevate water tables, which could potentially lead to an increase in forage production, which is actually what we're testing out in a couple of our projects right now with the division of Western Box Elder County that I'll be talking about a little bit later. Um, Dam complexes increase the system roughness and resilience of the stream, increases your large wave debris loading, and ultimately all this stuff is basically changing the timing, delivery, and storage of water sediment and nutrients in the watershed. So take homes from this section. Beaver need water and wood to make a living, not necessarily dams, and where streams or rivers don't provide what they need in terms of water depth, they'll build the dams and do that thus making the ecosystem engineers. And the impacts of their dam building are really what they what have the biggest feedbacks on the things that are of interest to us. But we cannot forget that they are pesky little rodents, and so we need to think about dealing with their nuisance behavior. Again, they can they do what they want and they cause messes, particularly in urban settings. Um, and so what we um, well, so there's a lot of different ways people have traditionally um, dealt with beaver nuisance behavior and, and still do. And so one of the kind of common methods has been to just go out and blow up, blow up their dams, which can be temporarily effective at controlling water height. But what many of you know that have worked with beavers is that if there are, if you don't actually go after the beaver themselves, they're just going to come back and repair that dam. And you're going to have the same problems you had before. So we, we think of using dynamite as more of a temporarily, temporary fix. Um, lethal trapping is also very common and happens all the time and it can be effective at alleviating some of your nuisance behaviors, particularly if you get all the beaver trapped out of a particular area. However, it can be really hard to actually trap out all the beaver and if you have a decent source population nearby, they're just going to find their way back in there. So what we recommend are these living with beaver strategies. So I'm going to talk a little bit generally about what they are and then provide a couple of examples of how we use them. So um, what we like to the sort of entry point of thinking about dealing with the nuisance and beaver problem is is really being clear about whether it's an actual problem or whether it's a perceived problem. So a lot of the sort of traditional notions about beaver is that they're just pests and anything they're doing is a problem. So sometimes people will see them out just doing their thing without actually building any dams or causing flooding, but just see signs of their activity and then and they'll think that's a problem that needs to be dealt with. So we we really try to be clear about sort of managing um, expectations and people's perceptions about beaver. And then if you determine that it is a real problem, then there are these solutions, these pretty pretty kind of common sense, low cost solutions for dealing with it. So beaver deceivers are basically just fencing around the culvert mouth. And you can get fancy with sort of how you 
kind of build the angles on that and how much fencing you use, but that's really what it is. It's just fencing around a culvert. Bond levelers are basically just piping. So this is, these are actually a couple pictures from a recent project we did in Logan with uh, Walmart and the city of Logan of implementing some of these living with beaver strategies. And so we put in a couple pond levelers and that just controls the height of your, of your ponded water basically. So the beaver can get in there, they can continue building up at the dam crest and they're not gonna actually elevate the height of that water because it's basically a big drain. Um, so, and then you can get into caging trees. Again, all these different techniques do require money and maintenance, and um, we do advocate live trapping and relocation as part of your living with fever strategies. That's definitely um, a go-to method if these other things don't work out. But at the end of the day, you know, there's been people that have done some cost comparisons. So this group, Beaver Solutions out of uh, Virginia, this guy Mike Callahan has published some pretty compelling cost comparisons looking at the last 10 or 15 years where he's been advocating these methods out there really successfully. Um, Virginia Department of Transportation uses them and so they've got some really good data basically showing that in the long term these methods require less money and less maintenance and you can still garner the benefits of beaver. So we really advocate these and there's some um, good resources for implementing them. So at this, at this point, you know, I mentioned before earlier in the talk, there's this beaver restoration guidebook. There's a link to it there. There's some um, really good hands-on info on living with beaver strategies there. And then there's some relocation information in this Tippy book. We're actually also working on our own um, restoration design manual with the division to um, basically tailor that manual to be pretty specific to the types of projects that the division might be doing. And so we're moving through that right now. Um, so getting into some of the beaver management plans that I <coughs> mentioned before, it's basically just a way to kind of write up all these different management techniques and then provide sort of a transparent framework for how you came to a particular management decision. The overall intent is to balance the needs of the landowners, the public, with the benefits that beaver provide. And so at this point, we've developed a few of these plans. This one for Hardware Ranch I'll talk a little bit more about. Another one for Walmart I'm not going to talk as much about. Um, and what we're really um, advocating is basically anytime we're thinking about doing a beaver project somewhere new as a way to get um, stakeholders interested is to basically try and develop this management plan to get as much input from people as possible. And it can be as simple as, you know, the rancher saying, well, I've got this culvert right here and there's beaver activity right here, so this is a potential uh, conflict area that needs to be sort of monitored. And so all that stuff actually can get written up into the plan using a simple adaptive management framework, which is really just come up with an idea, try it, see how it worked, and then you know change your idea if you don't like how it worked the first time. We provide these little kind of flow charts of how you can <coughs> basically show to why you came to a particular management decision. So you, know, you start up here on the upper left-hand side, asking yourself, well, is this dam actually causing harm? No, does it have the potential to in the future? Yes, monitor it. If it is causing harm, causing harm now, can you do something about it? No, or you've tried it before, it isn't working, get them out of there, put them somewhere where you want, live trap them. Um, if you haven't tried pond, if you have a flooding problem, you can try a pond leveler or this other thing called a beaver deterrent. And then if it's some sort of harvest of trees, then you do tree protection. So it's really, it's pretty, pretty obvious and straightforward, but it can be a nice way to kind of document how you came to a particular decision. So, briefly, um, getting into Hardware Ranch um, and the management plan that we have been developing there. Um, this map here is showing some brat outputs. I'll be talking about that a little bit later. So, all that really is is basically the beaver restoration assessment tool, and it's just showing <coughs> within the swing network at what level beaver dam building can be sustained. Um, again, yeah, I'll talk more about that, but. Long story short, it's good beaver habitat. Um, there's this whole area right here where all the ranch infrastructure is, and as many of you probably already know, there was what we call sort of an accidental beaver restoration of uh, Curtis Creek, where beaver just sort of made their way into the watershed back in around 2008. And uh, Beth Nielsen from Utah State was doing some research there and um, basically started to, had to change her whole research plan to kind of take advantage of the fact that beaver moved in there and has really generated some great data from that and there's been a pretty compelling paper that came out recently um, from that work. But anyway, they made their way in there and they've been creating this great habitat within here, but as you can see, there's some issues with flooding. 
And so I went out there um, with the ranch manager. We basically just walked around. I flew the drone, and we looked at potential problem areas. And so they've had some um, flooding problems already. So we actually recommended they put in a pond leveler here back in 2013 to prevent flooding downstream in this bunkhouse here, and it's worked fine since then. They haven't had any problems. They have had more dam building in other places um, where the threat of flooding isn't as high. We have recommended instead of a pond level, we're trying this beaver deterrent, which really is basically just a beaver scarecrow. It's probably the easiest living of beaver strategy that you can try. It costs very little. So far, we've seen some decent successes with it. Um, you're basically just hanging a sheet out there that scares beaver away. So. It's an easy thing to try right away if the risk of flooding isn't that great. If it doesn't work, then you go to something more serious like a pond level. Um, so we tried a couple of those that have actually been working fine. Um, in fact, we some of you folks helped to install some of those um, when we did a, uh, a, a recent beaver workshop with the division. Um, anyway, so yeah, we did a similar thing here with um, Walmart stores in the city of Logan. Um, some reason got a lot of attention about that. The media really liked that one for some reason. Um, anyway, we put in a couple final over there and it worked great. So, um, kind of shifting gears here a little bit, I'm going to talk more about some of the different types of restoration strategies uh, using Beaver. So, as as we all probably know, there's certainly a lot of opportunity for restoration and a need for it. Uh, a lot of our streams are not not doing very well. Need some help. So letting beaver do restoration is really not a new idea. People have been trying to use beaver strategically as early as the 30s, and then Idaho Fish and Game was parachuting them into places up, you know, high up in the watersheds to prevent downstream flooding. Um, so, but recently they've been sort of coming back in the spotlight, and then we know there's been a lot of attention about beaver and different organizations that are working in relocating beaver. Um, Something that we're really lucky to have here in Utah is really one of the most progressive beaver management plans in the nation where, it's, as far as I know, it's the only management plan that specifically calls on using beaver as a restoration tool. So that's a good thing. We've been um, also trying to sort of expand the potential um, list of streams where beaver can be relocated, but we're really, really fortunate to have a good beaver management plan in place. So really briefly here, these are just six different kind of approaches to doing beaver restoration from a more passive approach up top to a more active approach. And so I'm just going to walk through these really quickly and then just show uh, case study examples of how we're basically testing out these different strategies through some of our projects with the division. So um, essentially you can allow beaver to stay and just promote and protect them in a particular place using some of the beaver strategies. We're essentially Thinking about trying to do that with this 12 mile canyon project that is something that we're developing right now where there's beaver further up in the watershed, we're trying to get them to move down. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Um, accidental beaver restoration, so on Curtis Creek we had beaver just move in and, and set up shop there. Um, you can transplant beaver from one area to another area where they're where you want them to be and then just let them have at it. Um, we are testing out sort of a variety of relocation methods with this tanner project that I'll talk a little bit about here in a minute, um, a little bit with the basin project. And then uh, in places where you've got really hammered riparian areas where you need to do some riparian restoration before thinking about trying to transplant beavers, you can do some of that work using beaver name analogs, which I'll talk about in more detail here in a minute, uh, followed by transplanting beaver. We've done that in Basin Creek, and we're gonna test that out again in, in one of the streams with this tanner project. Um, you can build BDAs uh, for other purposes, not necessarily to restore the riparian area, but basically just to create beaver habitat and then hope the beaver take over. We've been doing that on the San Rafael River in southern Utah that I'll talk about um, a little bit later. Or you can basically, through the most uh, hands-on, uh, labor-intensive approach, basically just build beaver dams, take beaver dams, and then maintain them over time until you're able to get beaver in there. So a lot of different approaches, and we're testing them all out in these different Places. So, quick little inter interlude. What the heck are BDAs? I've mentioned that a number of times now, and all it is is what we what we're calling beaver dam analogs or artificial beaver dams. And so, we can build these things using uh, wooden fence posts and a hydraulic post pounder. Um, and that's this photo here is from uh, Mahogany Creek up in Western Box Elder County, where we 
built some of these back in 2014. Um, they're designed to be a structural kickstart, so they're not last designed to last forever, between like three to five years, depending on the aggregation rates and your hydrology. Um, the posts are relatively cheap, and you kind of put them where you want them with specific design objectives to initiate particular processes. Um, it's easy to do. You don't need heavy machinery. Not easy. It's labor intensive, but you don't you don't need heavy machinery to do it. And the idea is is to try and essentially use the water strategically to initiate particular restoration objectives. For example, um, so these two cartoon diagrams are showing just one um, uh, sort of standard BDA where you know you've got your fence post here and then some sort of surface that you're trying to elevate the water to to spread it out onto that floodplain. Um, and then you build in between these wooden fence posts with a series of willow weed and rock and cobble and then potentially slightly larger material downstream to create a mattress. Um, and to get at what I was saying before, they all have slightly different objectives. You can build different types of structures to do different kinds of things. So these constriction dams, they don't go all the way across the stream. They're meant to initiate localized widening or pool development and then downstream bar development as well as with various other topographic changes. And they can all be used in concert to create what we call complexes that may all have slightly different objectives that are all meant to work together. So in this case here, we're trying to liberate material from this meander bend and potentially here that then aggrades behind this primary dam, which is then reinforced by this secondary dam downstream. So there's a lot of different games you can play with the placement and the type of structures that you use. Um, okay, so, but it doesn't make sense to do this everywhere. And, you know, I just was going on and on about all these different ways you can do this. So where do we do it and, and why and what makes the most sense where? So we've developed these planning tools to help with that. Um, one of the ones that you guys are, many of you are probably already familiar with is the beaver restoration assessment tool. So I'll talk about that briefly. But we have some other uh, newer planning tools that we've been developing um, that are also very useful that I'll talk about. So essentially, again, remember it's the dams we care about, not really what other stuff the beavers do. Um, and where they build dams is more limited. So uh, that dam building activity varies dramatically according to how much water and how much wood they have. So, it's a fairly simple model. Um, it resolves where and at what level beaver dams can be built and sustained. And it does it down to the um, 250 meter reach scale. I just threw this up here. Wally McFarland, who's been the main developer with Joe Wheaton on this RAT model, they, they've got um, a paper out recently in geomorphology. <coughs> all about RAT that's, that's here. If anyone wants to look at that. Um, also, there's this RAT website with um, the BRAC model has been run at this point for all of the state, so all that data is freely available. The two main components are the uh, Beaver Dam Capacity Model and then sort of some other decision support and planning tools that I'm not going to talk about as much right now. But the main lines of evidence, data inputs, um, again, just come down to the right amounts of water and wood. So um, essentially, they need some kind of perennial water source. We use the NHD layer for that. Um, and then we need to know if there's the proper amounts of vegetation close enough to the stream that they can use it to build dams. So we use land fire data for that, both the current existing data and then the potential for historic layer. And then we need to know some about kind of the quality of the stream power. Is there enough base flow to support dam building? And is that flow not too high where it's going to blow all the dams out? So essentially, that's, that's the um, gist of it. There's, there's more to it than that, and it basically combines all those lines of evidence into this um, logical model called the fuzzy inference system, which then sort of bins the different outputs into these different categories. So, so for example, here we've got the current capacity to support beaver dam building, organizing these different um, categories from pervasive, saying you can support 16 to 40 dams per kilometer to none at all. And so this is basically just showing an example from how you can use BRAC for planning. Um, from uh, the Chalk Creek watershed in the Weaver. We did some work up there. We're working with some folks to potentially develop a beaver management plan. They want to do some sort of beaver restoration here. And so I just went through and Google Earth, counted all the existing dams, and then you can compare that number to what the model says can be currently supported and what could be supported if you were to do some restoration and get to a more historic condition. So interesting games you can play. Um, 
you can see see at what capacity you are currently. So for the whole Chalk Creek watershed with the dams that are there now, we're only about 15% of what the model saying could be supported there. So a lot of potential for restoration. Um, here I was just honing in on the South Fork Chalk Creek. These beaver management zones, that's the other part of the model I didn't talk about as much, but it basically combines the outputs from the capacity model and then uses some other lines of evidence about probability of conflict. Um, a few other things to basically come up with these categories of what we think should be um, your basically places where you shouldn't think about doing restoration at all, you know, and it kind of makes sense when you look at it within the landscape is down in these alluvial valleys where you've got more of your land use intensity, you're going to have more problems down there dealing with beaver. So if we're saying, hey, don't do it there, think about further up in your watershed, you're going to have better luck. Okay, so that was... Oh, Can I ask yeah. a question? Mm -hmm. Go back to that slide. Yep. <coughs> when you say that there are only like 33% of the 630 existing dams, that's only 33% of the entire potential, how yep. does this relate to what was there historically? Yeah, so um, it could be, so when we're talking about full capacity or half capacity, that full capacity is was more of a historic capacity. So what <coughs> when there wasn't intensive land use, you know, with the historic riparian vegetation, how many dams could be supported with that? Um, and again, you know, you're you're limited by the quality of your input data and land fire as 30 meter resolution. So there's some issues there, but um, in general, we've been pretty impressed with um, with the quality of the outputs. Um, hopefully that got your question. Um, okay, so briefly I'm going to talk about some other more recent planning tools. Um, Russ has been a big, uh, big force behind kind of uh, coming up with some ways for us to develop these tools that are then useful to some of his efforts um, and that uh, a, a number of these things we've been using within our restoration planning as well. So really you can use these things for all kinds of different stuff. It doesn't have to be just for beaver restoration, but it is it's just particularly useful for planning purposes, and since so much of beaver restoration is about the quality of the riparian vegetation, then some of these tools are useful for that. So, um, really quickly, I'm just going to go through three of these tools. The valley bottom tool um, is this automated GIS tool that delineates the boundary of your floodplain and your active channel. So, it's just shown here. This is a section of a weaver, but it's useful for um, delineating your riparian areas because essentially you're only going to have riparian areas within your valley bottom. And so at this point, uh, we've mapped the riparian areas for the whole state. Um, and so that's what's being shown here. This is your valley bottom in black, and then these little green pixels. I don't know if you see them, but those are your right, those are classified riparian. We got nine non riparian in there as well. Um, this tool is really useful for reach typing um, or habitat mapping because it basically is your first cut at, okay, this is where the river-related processes are outside of there, typically the more uplands related things. Um, and it's the backbone of some of the other tools. So um, again, you know, I kind of glossed over it, but we have the right grand areas mapped for the whole state, and that's, that's available data. Um, so, uh, the one other tool that Wally and others have recently developed is this riparian vegetation condition tool. They actually have a paper in 